In 2017, the Oxford Dictionary officially extended the meaning for woke this way, alert to injustice in society, especially racism. This terminology came into prominence following the 2014 shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. 18-year-old Brown and another individual, reportedly having stolen a box of cigarillos, were walking down the center of the street and a law enforcement officer came through and he asked them to step to the curb of the road and they did not comply. An altercation ensued and it, during the course of this altercation, Brown reached into the police vehicle and wrestled with the police officer for his gun. There was, when this was all over, when the incident was ended, uh, Brown had been shot several times and was dead. Protests immediately followed. Activist Brittany Packnett Cunningham wrote this. In August 2014, we weren't trying to change the world as much as we were trying to secure our own humanity. We saw in Brown's slain body the spirit of every black young person under threat by systems that seemed to feed on our downfall. The death of Brown is very sad, but not really so surprising. No 18-year-old should ever die over a box of cigarillos. It's also true that any person who wrestles with a police officer over his gun that's just likely to turn out badly, no matter what race or ethnicity you are. But Cunningham's statement opens up broader issues. She frames this matter in terms of systems that seem to feed on our downfall. Why does this particular 18-year-old symbolize the, the every black young person? Is there actually a system or a machine in operation that basically forces everybody into this system this setup of tragedy when it's all over they say there is and they call it systematic racism wokeness theorizes intricate systems of power and hierarchy which operate unjustly to confer advantages to one group at the expense of another group wokeness is actually the weaponization of postmodern theory an entire ideological edifice has been erected out of the ideas that come from wokeness. I'm going to describe these ideas in this series of presentations. This one today is just an introduction. We can say this, wokeness is much less about race than it is about power. There will never be a shortage of persons who seek to advantage themselves when there are cases of heartbreaking sadness out in the world. There's never going to be a shortage of people that would do that. Some cases will be actual cases of injustice. Others, are, others not so much. A lot of us believe that if an outcry goes up, that there must be some something behind it. You know, where there's smoke, there must be fire. And if people are crying out about something, there must be a terrible injustice that's been done. We sort of reflexively go there. But what if there's an entirely different moral paradigm operating, where facts are not facts, where the modus operandi is to create facts to suit the purposes or the agenda of a certain group? What if that's what's going on? What if the mission of the drivers of wokeness is to engineer a total change, a total transformation of society from what you think it is and what I, what we've grown up knowing it to be to something entirely different? What if that's the case? Authors James Lindsay and Helen Pluckrose uh, wrote this book, Cynical Theories, describing how these ideas have sorted themselves out from the beginning of postmodernism to where postmodernism has gone to today. And they, they call this applied postmodernism. This is a 2020 book. It just came out this year, this previous year. With applied postmodernism, they put it into two main premises and four uh, themes that go along with that. Here they are. The postmodern knowledge principle is this, radical skepticism about whether objective knowledge or truth is obtainable, and a commitment to cultural constructionism. The second principle is the postmodern political principle, a belief that society is formed of systems of power and hierarchies which decide what can be known and how. And then the four themes that go along with it, the blurring of boundaries, the power of language, cultural relativism, and the loss of the individual and the universal. So this is the DNA of woke. Let's unpack it a little bit. In woke, it's not that there is no objective truth. It's that humans really just don't have access to objective truth. So whether there is or isn't, or what it is or isn't, we really can't get there. We just There's no path from A to B. So we just sort of have to make it up as we go. And so that's where you get social constructivism, this commitment to the idea that we use language to construct reality. 
Social means groups of people or people are involved and construction means that there's a consensus or at least a, an agreement that, that such and such becomes the way we view the world. Truth is not what we find ourselves situated in, it's, it's the world that we humans have created in this way of thinking. The second premise goes right with this. Society is composed of systems of power and hierarchies. These are effectively uh, automatic, almost an innate machinery that just on the basis of human interactions, this is how things work. The very intricate systems, supposedly. And on the basis of these, these interactions, you have all these power relations. So this means that some groups are on top and others on the bottom. This means that a dominant group, supposedly, will impose its way of knowing on the other groups. And they just have to say, yes, sir. So the four themes make sense in, when we see them in relation to these two main premises. The blurring of boundaries, you have the idea that some people are oppressed. And so, for example, there is two categories, male and female, and these are oppressive, supposedly, categories. To address that, what do you do? You blur the boundaries between those categories. That way people won't be oppressed by the categorization. Language is all-powerful, and so language is used to shape and control emphases and basically our perception of the world. So you've got to control it. And this is what's behind all the censorship and canceling of people on Twitter and, and across the Internet and YouTube, because you've got to control the language. That way you can decide uh, what is perceived or what is to be reality and what isn't. As Robin DiAngelo, the author of this book, which we'll look at in a future video, White Fragility, which you're probably tired of hearing about this book, but as she says in her book, the ability to determine which narratives are authorized and which are suppressed is the foundation of cultural domination. So then cultural relativism is the third item there in the themes, and it naturally accompanies these other views. You have each group has its own knowledge, and knowledge is separated into by, by the group. And you can't access another person's knowledge, and so it's the number of different intersections or different ways that knowledge interacts. And so, uh, so you have Hispanic knowledge, black knowledge, white knowledge, scientific knowledge, male knowledge, female knowledge, etc. You have all these subdivisions of groups. And you can't access the knowledge of another group. You can't even criticize the knowledge of another group. Individuals really don't matter anymore. What matters is the color of your group or the, or the sexual preference, the sexual practice of your group. We'll look more closely at this intersectionality theme and standpoint theory and all that in future pieces of our series, but I want to come back to the protests in Ferguson. The protests there insisted that persons of color were being overwhelmingly attacked by uh, white oppression police that were oppressing them, uh, white supremacy. But what are the facts? Author Heather MacDonald has looked at some of these facts. And this is what she says in a very recent article. She says that the statistics tell a different story. There is no epidemic of white police officers shooting African Americans. The June 22, 2020 update of police shootings for 2019, for example, showed 14 unarmed blacks and 25 unarmed white persons that had been shot by police. In America, police make about 10 million arrests per year. There are an average of 27 deadly weapons attacks every day against police officers. Meanwhile, African Americans between the ages of, check this, 10 and 34, they are killed, they're homicided at a rate 13 times more than white Americans. According to a 2015 Gallup poll, twice the number of black Americans want increased police presence in their communities compared to the number of of white persons. So in spite of numbers like these, Cunningham said, we saw in Brown's slain body, this represented the spirit of every black young person under threat by systems that seemed to feed on our downfall. It didn't matter that he was apparently in possession of stolen property. It didn't matter that he was high on THC, a drug in his bloodstream, that he wrestled with the police officer over his own firearm. None of these things mattered. It didn't matter that he wasn't really shot with his hands up as the protesters uh, insisted. What mattered was that the police officer was a white person and he was supposedly the oppressor class. Brown was a non-white person 
And this was a case of white supremacy, a case of systematic racism. That's what supposedly really mattered here. It wasn't about social justice. It was about creating a narrative that fed a certain theme that social justice warriors or people who were uh, really pushing on this, on this critical race theory, this wokeness that we're talking about in this series, that they wanted to see put to the top of the line. That's what really mattered. It was about creating a narrative. Remember, creating a narrative is actually about changing the culture. Changing the culture is actually about power relations and hierarchies. So this isn't about social justice. This is about taking the frayed, what we really have left of societal cohesion at present, and making it as much worse as possible to bring dramatic change. That's what it was really about. By the way, in case you wondered whether they really mean it when they're talking about defunding the police, uh, I've got some, some in the notes you'll see below. Uh, I've read from these books. I've got some quotations uh, where you'll, you'll see they really mean it. And I've got several quotes there that you'll find quite interesting. They really mean to eliminate prisons and the police. So just in case you wondered if that was like exaggerated, no. Black lives do matter. But whereas intersected or minority lives are seen to be more valuable than the, I guess, the dominant group, Christianity says that we're all in need of salvation through Jesus, that Jesus died to emancipate every slave of sin. We are saddened by incidents of injustice and unfairness. Of course we're saddened. The sooner this is over and those things are ended, the sooner Jesus comes, the better. But the reality is quite a bit more nuanced than those who want to claim that America is filled to the brim with systematic racism. Actually, what we should do now is become much more aware of deeply laid agendas behind the danger of wokeness. Our next presentation traces the shift of thought from the Enlightenment to the present, and we'll use some material from Stephen R.C. Hicks's book here, Postmodernism Explain, Explaining Postmodernism. And we're going to look at how this begins and gets to where postmodernism is so that we can really understand how then postmodernism develops into applied postmodernism. So we'll be taking this further. This was just an introduction, but hopefully an important one to help us understand the issues in a bit of a different way than what you're commonly seeing. I'll invite you to come and join me again for The Woke Danger Part 2.